You're listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. This is the show that talks about identity and access management and making sure you know who has access to what. Let's get started. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How's it going? I'm good. How about you? Good, man. It's uh, it's 2021. We're still one of the top IEM podcasts in the world, which <laughs> that's impressive stuff right there. <laughs> and uh, these are interesting times in our home country, the United States, wouldn't you say? I would say so. There's been uh, a little bit of news recently in uh, the U.S. Uh, for unfortunate reasons, but um You know, this is not a political show, so we will try to steer clear of any potential uh, landmines. I am as a bipartisan topic. How about that? I'm still optimistic about 2021, hopefully being better than 2020. I'm hoping to be able to, um, you know, hit the road again and do a little bit of travel by the end of the year and and see and meet many of our listeners out at uh, IAM conferences. Yeah, that's definitely the thing I, mean, I think I miss the most is at this point, I'm ready to get back out on the road. Once it's safe, once, you know, vaccinations and stuff like that have have reached some sort of, um, you know, whatever metric is to make it make it safe for folks. But yeah, I, you know, I've been in home since March. My my Google Maps timeline is the saddest thing that I think I've ever seen in my entire life. It's like for the month of December, you only went five miles away from your house. <laughs> so <laughs> Not not the most exciting uh, of uh, bra- of uh, you know travel things, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, I'm sure it'll pick back up. Like I said, I think I think it'll be towards the end of the year. I don't like what you're thinking, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Absolutely. So we're going to learn about uh, a certain organization in the identity space that we've been looking to have on for a while. Um, we probably shift to identity talk because I don't think anyone wants to hear about our vacation and and our travel plans, et cetera. Uh, so let's talk about women and identity. Uh, it's an organization that's been around for a little while. And to help us with that conversation, we've got one of the leaders of the organization. It's Kay Chopard. She's a U.S. ambassador and a variety of other titles, as we've been just talking with her, uh, that she's helping out with from that organization. So welcome to the show, Kay. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I'm excited to be here and talk with you both. Well, you came highly recommended from a couple of folks that we've had on the past, people like Nishant Kaushik and um, Ian Glazer. And, you know, we're excited to have you on the show. I'm I'm also excited because we may or may not get a audio appearance from Piper the Cat. We will see if uh, um, if that happens or not. If we get a, a some comments on identity from Piper, that would be great as well. But in the absence of that, you know, our traditional first question that we always like to start with is, how did you get into the identity space? Is it something that chose you or did you choose it? You know, it's a great question. Um, and so it, it chose me. Um, it was not something I was looking for and I was doing something so completely different. So I, um, I think I I have told you before, I'm an attorney by training and I started out in, you know, doing the traditional practice of law things. And then I moved into um, in the nonprofit world, actually, and I was managing national nonprofit memberships and someone um, actually in the identity field who I had met in other circumstances um, recruited me to help uh, create the first sort of nonprofit public-private partnership with NIST, National Institute for Standards and Technology. Um, This was back in 2012 uh, when they were working on this uh, national strategy for trusted identities in cyberspace, and they wanted to create a nonprofit and have this sort of public-private partnership where industry, the identity industry, would be working uh, sort of hand in hand with government and to try to accomplish all these different things. And it was a terrific opportunity. And I said, sure, but um, I have to tell you that the first six months, my head hurt like every day because I really had to learn about the I am field. There was a lot of terms that you all use that I'd never heard of, acronyms, Um Really, the first six months, I thought, what was I thinking, you know, Um, and I was really brought in for my management skills, frankly, and to really help set up the organization organization to get started. Uh, But it turned out 
to be something that I really loved. And I even tried to go away, right? I got recruited actually to run a different nonprofit back in the, in the legal world. Um, I only stayed there about three years. And as soon as I decided to go off on my own, all these identity folks started calling and saying, hey, does this mean you can do projects? And so I've gotten right back into it. And I'm really grateful for that because I really, I enjoy the people and I enjoy the work. And I think um, as we're dealing with a pandemic, it's becoming even more important. Um, so it's an exciting place to be. Okay, I have to say that uh, it comes to mind, you might be the only attorney that I've met within the identity management field. You're certainly the first that we've had on the podcast before. And I think that probably gives you a unique perspective. I'm not, I'm not sure if that uh, triggers any thoughts that you would have in terms of what is that unique perspective or is it just kind of the framework and that you're given as a, as a law student to, to how to approach problems, but um, what makes it different, do you think, that, that you bring to this identity field? Um, well, I think that a lot of what I bring to it, and, and I wouldn't attribute anything I learned in law school at all to this, but I think that a lot of what I bring to this is that um, in many ways I have a practical point of view, but I'm very, um, I see the legal policy that is often involved in things that people don't think about. And I often, I'm often a broker, if you will between uh, people who are using the I am uh, technology, need it, have to have it. But a lot of times they just want to delegate and they'll say, um, you know, I just finished a project with a prosecutor's office and they just wanted their IT people to make decisions. But you can't do that because how you structure whatever kind of identity, authentication, all these things there's a policy reason for why you do the things the way you do. Um, and a lot of it is grounded in some very important legal policies and legal principles. And a lot of times people don't understand that. Um, you know, I do a lot of work, for example, uh, in the legal community around digital evidence. And people forget that when um, you have a surveillance ca uh, camera at a 7-Eleven and they've captured a drug buy or something in the parking lot, right? Well, the innocent bystanders that are captured by the camera have their own privacy rights, not just the people who are, you know, involved in illegal activity. And I think a lot of times we don't realize that that's not an IT decision, what you do with that, right? Um, so if I'm a mom and my kids are in my mini minivan eating a slushy and they don't know about this, you know, they don't want their images splashed all over the internet in the name of transparency. Um, so there's a lot of things that people have to think through. That's a very simplistic example. But um, so I think that that's kind of what I bring to it. I see a lot of the policy implications that I have concern that people don't always pay enough attention to. Oh, that's that that's a, a great perspective. So one thing I'd like to maybe shift to is talking about women and identity. One thing I love is that the you know the concept is kind of baked into the name women and identity, but maybe you can tell us a little bit more. What is the organization all about? Maybe tell us a little bit about the history of the organization and kind of the mission. Well, I, I certainly think that the leadership, the impetus for this came from women who work in, in this industry, right? And I think that's happened a few years ago. People were talking about it and they kind of said, why not? Um, so actually, although there's a big US presence, people like me, um, this actually started as a nonprofit um, based in the UK. So that's currently where sort of our headquarters, if you will, are. It's um, it's a hundred percent volunteer organization. So there's no staff at this point. There's not people who are paid. I'm a volunteer, uh, so I you know I have a day job, but I I'm very passionate about women and identity. So I devote time to it, um, and that's and that's really everyone that's involved. And you know the vision for the organization is that. Uh, Identity that's for everyone should be created by everyone and, and really pushing um, that diversity. I mean, we talk obviously about women in particular, but that really expands, you know, to people of color and to people of different 
uh, sexual preference and gender and, you know, just all these different things. Disabilities, that's another one that we've started to see. Um, just really saying we need to be more representative in the IAM world and we're, we haven't done that enough. Um, and now that said, um, I think the other thing that is really unique and I think sort of special about women in identity is that the membership is also very diverse, right? So it's not just women. There are lots of men who belong. Um, and I am amazed at the commitment of some of the men in the organization who really see diversity as critical to um, how we work, how our companies are organized, um, our work teams and all that kind of thing, but also the products that are being developed to be really useful to our clients. It's really important that we have that diversity in creating the things that we do. So I don't know, does that offer any? That, no, that's perfect. And I have a follow-up question if I could is, um, you know, like the Identity at the Center podcast, it's a global organization. I, I, I kind of say that in a joking way, but, you know, two thirds of our audience is based in the U.S. and a whole one third is outside of the U.S. And one of the things that we have to be really careful is since Jeff and I both live in the U.S., a lot of our, our guests are U.S. based is not making it 100 percent of a U.S. based focus podcast. And when I think about women and identity as a global organization, the question comes to mind that, you know, or, or the question would be, you know, are the challenges that women face in identity the same around the world, same as the U.S.? Or are they facing different challenges based on where in the world they are? That's a great question. And, and I certainly, I don't want to pretend to speak, there's over a dozen countries that are part of women in identity, and all of them have an ambassador like me, uh, and I can't speak for all of them, but I will tell you that um, we host weekly coffee calls on Fridays, and the first coffee call, and I'm the one who hosts those, and the first one is always with folks who are on the other side of the world for where, where I am. I'm based in Washington, D.C., um, so like New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, and so on. Um, and what's interesting is uh, we usually talk about certain substantive topics when it comes to uh, really more about the diversity topic and how it relates to identity. And what's interesting is, is that everything we talk about resonates with those folks as well, right? So, um, for example... I, uh, there's a couple of uh, women from Singapore who are often on those calls. And we've talked about things like, um, so for example, we talked about when women speak, often um, women's voices are not given as much credit or as weight, as much weight. Uh, and there's a lot of research about that, which I'm happy to share with you. So this is not me just saying, oh, you know, sour grapes, my experience. No, we know a lot about that and it's very cultural. And, and many times that even means other women, right? Who give less credit to women's voices and their opinions. And when I'm talking with folks in some of these other cultures, uh, that's an example where it really resonated with them. So it really, they felt the same, but, but their sense was their, the cultural um, norms, if you will, that they have to overcome those challenges are at a higher bar than maybe what we experience in the U.S. So that in that sense, um, and and I and I can't begin to explain, you know, Japanese culture or any other of those. Um, but it's a it is a different mindset and a different experience. So it what I have found so far is that the issues seem to be the same, but sometimes the degree or some of the things that are real barriers for them. Um, you know, are, have a different have a different place where they are. And I think the same is true in, in some countries, I actually think that women in leadership are more well accepted uh, than they are in the US or the UK, for example. So, you know, it's, uh, I guess it's, we're, we're not homogenous, even though the issues I think resonate, but sometimes to a, a, a greater or lesser degree, depending on the, the country, if that makes sense. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, obviously, cultural differences will weigh in on any number of things. But, you know, given the 
you know, traditional male female roles in, in those cultures would certainly play out into business, which is identity and all this other stuff too. Um, as far as partnerships with other organizations, um, I think women identity has, you know, some level of um, either overlap or maybe even something more formal than that with organizations like ID Pro. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what what that overlap might look like, and you know h- how that works uh, from two organizations kind of working together, sort of in the same space, but with a little bit of different focuses? Sure, sure. Well, I I think that's very true. I think ID Pro has been very supportive of women in identity um, and women in identity as well. We have a lot of uh, cross membership. Uh, I'm I'm a member of ID Pro and of Women in Identity, right? And I think a lot of people are. Uh, and so we've done so. And there's other organizations uh, in Canada. There's DIAC, which I am not going to remember exactly what that stands for, but Joni Brennan runs that organization, and they and they're doing a lot of really great things. Um, in New Zealand, there's Digital Identity New Zealand, which is also a nonprofit. Um, and, and we really uh, support each other. So some of it is we have, you know, the cross-pollinization of, of some same members. And, but a lot of it is um, supporting each other's events, um, each other's uh, education and outreach. Um, and, and I think in some ways sort of supporting each other's missions, uh, which is, I also think, really, really important. And... And I think the other thing is um, a lot of times you'll be doing something, you know, we're supporting a conference or something and I'll, and I'll say to people, Hey, have you, you know, uh, brought ID pro in on this? Because it seems like there would be certain areas that they would have expertise or be helpful, blah, 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 whatever it might be. So um, I think that's very true. We, we haven't, I don't know. I don't know if we have a, a very formalized relationship at this point, but uh, there's certainly a lot of mutual support and respect, uh, and, 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 and it makes a big difference. And that's how I actually, I became aware of women identity was at an identiverse conference, probably, I think it was maybe two or three years ago. And I remember seeing, um, you know, the banners for it. I was like, oh, okay, that's kind of cool because, you know, traditionally it, and really as a subset of that identity has been male dominated, right? You go into these conferences and it's like, Ooh, there's a girl. <laughs> It was kind of like a rarity. And over the last few years, it's, you know, it's, I've definitely noticed a much stronger trend for, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, not only diversity, but inclusion for, for some of the other folks. And that's where I saw it. And I, and I know there's a lot of overlap between membership. You know, I'm a member of ID Pro. I'm also a member of Women in Identity, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, it, I think that's something that, you know, maybe some people just may not be aware of, of, you know, who can actually join these and um, that there is a place at the table at the, at an organization like women identity for men to help support and, you know, be part of that organization and help extol, you know, the virtues of diversity and inclusion, making sure that identity problems are being looked at holistically and not just from one point of view. And I think, a lot of good products, just like identity can be for an organization, follows that same process where um, you know you have diversity of opinions, diversity of use cases. Uh, you, know, you mentioned not just women, but also you know um, you know usability concerns, right? That come up out of this stuff like that. So I think it's important that when people who are in charge of identity for their organizations, you know, people that are listening, is that they understand that it is not a one size fits all, and that there are going to be different uh, viewpoints that can contribute to a much stronger product in the identity space, whether that product is their identity program at their organization or an actual software service, right? That's being developed, those sorts of things. So I always found that really interesting. And I think one of the things that is also helpful as part of this is, you know, the idea of mentoring and getting people out there uh, and, and helping them be successful. Um, One of the things I love about the identity space is, you know, people are very, very welcoming to it, right? Whether you've been in the space for, you know, six months or if you've been it for 15, 20 years, right? I think there are a lot of people who are willing to share their knowledge and people don't have to necessarily, you know, run the same roads maybe that have been run over before and haven't, haven't been as great of experience, right? Be able to learn from that. And one of the things I think would be interesting to hear from you is 
what sort of value does mentoring, uh, you know, provide for folks out there, but also being a mentee, right? The opposite of being open to having that sort of, you know, relationship with someone who's maybe got some experience and kind of can take you under your wing, under their wing and, you know, help shepherd and guide, um, you know, some of the folks into the space? That's a great question. I'm trying to think about where do I start? So at the moment, Women in Identity doesn't really have a formal mentoring program, right? But there is a lot of informal mentoring. And we have, I myself have started looking at a lot more research about how to make that happen and, and the benefits of that. Um, you know, it's sort of interesting. McKinsey and company did a study that showed for the last 20 years, uh, companies where there was uh, a, women in leadership, like C-suite level, right? High up leadership, experienced 15 to 20% increased revenues over companies who did not. And yet it has not been enough of a motivator to change the diversity, right? So if money's not driving our interest in this, what does it take? And a lot of the research shows that it goes back to what I said before, sort of, you know, it's systemic, it's cultural. So how, how do we overcome that? Um, one of the things that we know is that men are more likely to mentor other men and be comfortable with that and sort of do it without hesitating, without thinking. Um, you know, I don't know what the factors are for sure, uh, but men have not always been willing to do that as often for women. And I think it's really important that they be willing to do that um, and they be willing to champion them, you know, and say good things about them, even when they're not in the room. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, I think uh, we have to rely on that men will build up that expertise. So I know I mentioned to you before, there's a terrific book called Athena Rising, which was written by two old white guys. And it basically explains why it's important for men to mentor women and how to do that, um, which in some ways isn't all that different from mentoring men, but uh, sometimes it's a different mindset and a willingness to take that risk. Um, and, and even you mentioned Identiverse. So this past summer, I spoke about these issues at an Identiverse session, and one of the gentlemen in the chat said, uh, you know, he said, a lot of times when I'm in meetings and women are the ones being interrupted or they don't get as much chance to talk, whatever he said, I try to share my white boy power and I, <laughs> and I make sure that they get called on or I say, hey, you mentioned this. I think that was a good idea. Why don't we let you know, such and such, tell us more um, and do those kinds of things. And, and we, the, the wonderful thing about women and identity is we all have to come together. And I am so grateful for the men who are willing to do that. That said, I think there are often uh, other challenges that women face um, and that sometimes it's easier for, for women to, you know, help other women. Uh, and, and that's one of the things, certainly, as an organization, we're trying to do. And so I've had the opportunity to kind of do some of that informally with women, like we mentioned about, in other, in other countries. One woman in particular who I really helped get through a whole career change to change a different job. Um, and some of that was about the support to say, you don't have to be unhappy and there are other things out there and you can, you know, continue in the I am field. You don't have to leave um, to go on and do other things. And she's doing terrific and I'm thrilled for her. So I think it's a real mix, but it, it really is critical. And in some ways, although identity has been around for a long time, it, in some ways it feels like a newer field. And maybe it's because there's so much emphasis now, especially with the pandemic, um, that really, uh, I encourage people who may not have thought about this as a career that it really, I mean, it's a legitimate career choice and you should make it, you should make that choice, um, for so many different reasons. So did I answer the question? No, it was a great, great answer. You know, and I find it so interesting because you, we've talked a few times now and, um, you mentioned that piece about men mentoring women. And it's really something that I've, I've chewed on a lot. And kind of came to the conclusion, yeah, I can kind of feel that because I think in our society, we're always looking for the ulterior motive. Okay, why is he, why is he helping out her? Maybe he likes her. 
And so as long as that kind of mentality exists, there's the potential that people hold back and are afraid to be, you know, looked at in that way. Does that make sense to you? Or does that resonate with you? I do think that there are people who have concerns, but I have to tell you, for me personally, in my own career, uh, I, there's a lot of things. Well, remember when I said I got recruited to go into, you know, I helped start up the Identity Ecosystem Steering Group, IDSG, back in the day. Um, that was a man, right? He saw me in other settings. And I'm so grateful that he saw my talent, if you will, my skills, and and said, hey, we really need what you bring to the table. And if he hadn't done that, the trajectory of my career would be so different. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. So I, I do think that there's some of that, but um, I, I think it's really, I mean, you have to think about how you handle all of that. Uh, and, and there's always going to be bad actors, but I think by and large, um, there's a lot of people that when you see someone who does a really good job and you like them and you think that they deserve a shot, you know, I, I think it's terrific. And, and, how close is that relationship? It's not like he and I were best buddies. We weren't. Um, but that said, he, you know, it was such a jump start to my career. Um, and there's a lot of other people like that or people who influence me about how I just, my philosophy, if you will. And, uh, and that made a big difference. So, and, I, and I'm grateful to a lot of men. I'm also grateful to a lot of women, but I'm very fortunate that way. And I hope that others will take the risk, if you will. I mean, as long as you have good motives, as long as you're there to help and support other people, um, that's really what makes the difference. And I, and I think when you're genuine that way, that's what shows through, right? And so when you say, hey, you should take a look at this person because they're really good for whatever reason, and, and then that comes to pass. It's like, I don't want to recommend somebody because my professional reputation is on the line unless I think they're really good. And I think when people see that and they're like, oh, wow, you're right. She really knows her stuff. And, you know, that was a good that was a good thing. So um, I, I know what you're saying. I, you can feel that risk. But I think in some ways in the field, it's gotten better. I'm not exactly sure why, but you got to be able to be willing to take some risks like that. Otherwise, nothing's ever going to change. Um, you use the word gratitude. That resonates with me. Um, in terms of gratitude, women and identity has been built by on the backs of a lot of people. And I was wondering if you maybe wanted to shout out some of those people and talk about the contributions that they've made. Sure. Well, I, I, I'd like to start. And I think I appreciate you giving me the chance to do this. So the original board of directors for the uh, Women in Identity, which, as I mentioned, started in the UK, is actually a mix of UK and US professionals. And I'd really like to shout out to them. Emma Lindley, Colette D'Alessandro, Pam Dingle. Those three women like sort of built this. They took something that was talked about and made it real. So I really give them a lot of credit. And Pam recruited me to be part of this. So, you know, I'm thrilled for that too. Um, but along with that, we have some other people that are members and have really made a difference. Like if I could shout out about some of the men who are members, um, Ian Glazer, uh, who I know that you all know, he's been fantastic. I've made him speak at all kinds of women and identity events. And, but he's really good at promoting us and working together, which is fantastic. Nishant Kashuk, who I'm probably not saying his name right, but Nishant is on almost every Friday coffee call with me. Uh, and I just can't get over his commitment to diversity. Um, it's amazing and it's terrific. He's very thoughtful. Um, and he's just very supportive also. And, and another uh, man who's been um, really helpful to me is uh, Andrew Weaver. Andrew is actually in New Zealand. I've learned a lot from their approach to diversity and to a lot of other issues. And he is another one. Uh, I had him and uh, Tamara Al-Salim, who's the ambassador to New Zealand. They were on a panel for me at a conference that would have been in DC if we were meeting in person. Um, 
And he's the one who spoke up and said, hey, women and identity is wonderful. Everyone on this call should join. So, uh, you know, it's nice when the men are saying this is a worthwhile organization. So I guess those would be the folks. I mean, um, Helen Chu in Singapore is terrific. I mentioned Tamara, um, Melissa and Chanda Jackson and Nicole Landry. They're all up in Canada. They're also really helpful to me, as you can imagine, uh, Canada and the U.S. work together, all of the other leadership folks. So it's a great organization and it can be a lot of work when you're completely sustained by volunteers um, and there's no paid staff. So it's we have to all pitch in and support each other. And and we really do that. And like I said, we're all in this together. And uh you see that in the entire organization and all the work we do. And I think it makes a big difference. And I'm like, as you said, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm very grateful. You know, I was sitting here listening while you were talking about, you know, all these great people that are in the space. And, and you know, if you haven't, if you haven't heard Ian speak, you know, he was on actually on the show previous to this one. So go back and listen to that one if you missed it. Um, but, I, you know, I was sitting here thinking about, mentor and mentee and some of the folks that, that at least that, that I've come into contact with. And I'll be honest, I'm a terrible mentee. I'm very individual. You know, I kind of like to learn things myself and, you know, that's just me, but I like, you know, I don't mind being in that mentorship type role with other folks. And I'm thinking about the times when I've actually been a mentee and didn't even know it. And the most pivotal, pivotal, that's not even a word, pivotal <laughs> uh, mentors that I think that I've had at different points in my IM career were all women. You know, I'm thinking of my first job in the identity space. I was the first man on an all woman team building Lotus Notes IDs and Rack FIDs. So in the spirit of shout outs, I'm going to shout out Caroline and Kathy, right? They're the ones that really got me into the identity space, showed me the ropes, you know, whether they, whether they liked it or not, <laughs> you know, that's how that worked out. You know, I think of managers that I've had in the past, Maria, who has really kind of kickstarted my career in me taking a more active role in managing my career versus just being a passive bystander. And I think of other really strong women that I've been really, you know, happy to, to be associated with in previous roles uh, that I've held people like Tina and Jamie and, and folks like that, who, you know, man or woman, they know their stuff, right? They're great to work with and their success helped my success. So, you know, I, I think I went on a little bit of a, of a, of a dry drive there, but, you know, it, it just got me thinking here as you were talking, it's like, you know what, now that I think about it, you know, they've played a very pivotal role in my career itself. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to see, you know, those different viewpoints being um, more recognized in the space. And, you know, I hope others will, you know, take the opportunity to take a look at their organizations, whether it's up or down from wherever they happen to be sitting and, you know, take advantage of, you know, the really smart people that are probably already in the organization and, and listening to those viewpoints. So, uh, I, I I appreciate you sparking that in me. And again, shout out to Caroline, Kathy, Maria, Tina, Jamie, you know, you guys know who you are. I, I, I don't know if you're listening, but, you know, you all had a big impact on, on my career. So shout out to them. Your jerker moment. <laughs> um, well, you've been super gracious with your time and I want to make sure we respect that. You know, one of the things that we like to talk through also is, you know, how can people get better. As Jim likes to say, how do you sharpen the saw, right? What keeps you um, on top of, of your role within the identity space? You know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be identity based itself, right? It can be getting better at any facet of your professional career. Um, you mentioned a book uh, earlier, um, the uh, Athena Rising book, and, and we'll have links in our show notes to, you know, things that we talk about here so people can easily reference it. Um, but are there other resources that you think uh, other people should check out to to help them, you know, whether it's identity or diversity or, you know, women identity specifically? What I do to kind of sharpen the saw, which is a good way to put it, um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit more deliberate about when I see webinars or uh, books or articles, 
about, especially for me about diversity, whether it's race or gender or disability, whatever it might be, um, I actually try to be a little bit more, more proactive and build time in my day to pay attention, to read things, um, to watch those webinars, uh, even though nobody's paying me to do that. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of on my own time. But I think it makes what happens is it makes me better in everything else that I do. So I, I tend of late, I have done more around diversity, equity, and inclusion than I have around identity. Although I'm at lots of identity conferences and webinars and all that kind of thing. But I think I, I'm really sharpening the saw there. So uh, I may have mentioned to you before, I, I signed up uh, here in the US, the Big Ten Law Schools. I am an alum of one of those Big Ten Law Schools which is probably how I heard about it, did a whole series on race and the law, but it was really, it's free, and it was not really set up uh, as some kind of, you know, legal education. It really is an introduction about issues. And remember when I, we talked about early in the podcast, where I feel like a lot of times I'm looking at what are what are the policy issues? What are the legal implications? But what are the policy issues that come out of identity? And when you start to see, it's just a real awakening for me about areas that I hadn't even thought about. Um, and then I also have I have my own little reading list, and I and I read a lot of books um, that are specific. I mentioned Athena Rising, another one when I talked about women's voices. There's a book uh, called uh, The Silent Sex. Um, and it's really about what are those cultural norms we have that we aren't even aware of um, that give less credibility to women's voices. And there's all kinds of science and research about so many of these areas and more than I've touched on here. Um, so uh, that's what I do. I, I, I read, I choose to not read the novel, but read the book that's a little more educational. And what I find is that for all of us, in a lot of ways, this is about becoming aware, um, pay, you know, just sort of paying attention. In Athena Rising, it recommends that when you're, you're working with a group of people, you sort of take a step back and see who gets interrupted, who talks most of the time, whose ideas get taken over by others, you know, and, and basically it says, and if you watch, you'll see that it's all women. Women are the ones that get interrupted. Women are the ones who don't get time to talk. Women are the ones whose ideas get taken over by others. I mean, and these are guys, you know? So it was, I hadn't thought about that. Um, and a lot of times we women, we, you know, we're doing some of this same thing to ourselves. So I think it's important to just keep educating yourself, to be aware, to read about or watch these webinars and think about, look for, where does this apply in my own life? Um, because I think that's how we really make change. It's not by a checklist about our hiring procedures or anything else. It's really about what do we take and internalize? How do we grow? And we have to be committed to, I think, our own growth, to sharpening the saw, as you say. And to do that takes a little bit of effort, but I have been amazed at the ways that I feel like I've grown and how my knowledge has expanded, um, you know, because of the research and the hard work of other people who are willing to share that. That word awareness, I think that sparks a good thing that, that I think people really need to take into consideration, right? Being aware of your surroundings and how your actions affect up and down, but also people are watching, right? There's a lot of people who are looking at, um, you know, different people, whether it's in the organization or whatever it may be, and the way that you conduct yourself has an impact on people that you may not even be aware of. So, you know, take that into account when, you know, when, when you're designing your identity programs, when you're running the business, you know, of your identity, whatever it may, maybe looks like, um, you know, take that into consideration. So I just had one thing I would like to say, and it's really something that you said, Jeff, that I think is so important. And that is that you can be a leader no matter what position you are in the company. You don't have to be an executive to be a leader. And I think your comment about other people are watching is very true. And the more that uh, you become aware and you embrace that diversity, that inclusion, um, 
you'll be a leader right where you are, even if you're an entry level person. So I just would encourage people that you don't have to wait till you've been at this for 10 years. You can start right now and people will pay attention. Uh, and I think Jeff's right about that. So I appreciate you raising that. Those are all good stuff. And I will definitely have this listed in the show notes. So the Big Ten series, Athena Rising, The Silent Sex, you know, maybe we'll even get a, a link to, uh, you know, Kay's, Kay's big brain list of bibliography books, you know, whatever that looks like. Um, we'll try to include as much of that in the show notes as possible, as possible so people can check that out. Um, Kay, before we wrap things up, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you um, or, you know, check out Women in Identity? What's what's the uh, the best way for people to look into that? Well, I, I would suggest, um, you know, the Women in Identity website is a really great place to start. And, and I encourage everyone, whoever you are and whatever position you're in, to sign up. I think it provides a lot of good educational background. It also gives you a really terrific network. Um, and it's very talking about, it raises awareness, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, you will have to be approved, but that's mostly because we got spammed a lot in the beginning. So we realized we had to, had to do that. But there's always, you know, I mentioned the coffee calls. Once you sign up, I would encourage everyone to join us for the coffee call. It's a half hour and you know, sometimes, and the topics are all over the place and you can introduce anything you want to talk about too. So it's a great group. Um, we have two calls to accommodate different parts of the, of the globe. Um, there are, uh, for reaching me, I'm, uh, I have a profile and I believe my, uh, women and identity email is on there. Um, again, that's my volunteer. I mean, I have a day job and I have a, a separate email, but, for women in identity, it's just k at womeninidentity.org. Not hard to find. Um, women in identity has a LinkedIn page. It has a Twitter. I'm also on Twitter and LinkedIn, and we, uh, you know, so we try to post and and uh, and and put a lot of information out on social media. For example, the coffee calls. Always on Twitter, you'll see what time it is, the link to get on, and what the topic is for that particular week. So with usually I, I give them an article for people to, you know, spend two minutes to read about the topic. Um, so that would, those are probably the easiest ways uh, to be in touch. And I, I would love to talk with anybody and answer any questions. And, um, you know, I, I just encourage, we're, we're very inclusive and, and very welcoming. So. I'm so glad to hear that both of you have signed up. So, and Kay, there's no cost to join as well, right? Oh, that's true. I forgot to mention. Thank you for that. You're right. There are no member dues. So it's free. Membership is free. And we mostly rely on things, you know, like paying for our website from corporate uh, sponsors. Uh, and you'll see they're listed on, on our website too. We have quite a few uh, companies that really help us keep the doors open. But you're right. There is no dues. And as I said, it's a it's all volunteer run. So that's great. So the website is womeninidentity.org. And we'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. So, you know, encourage people to not only check it out, but you know, become a participant, you know, be part of the conversation uh, and uh, you know, drive up that personal network and and you know communicate and identify with other folks that are in the space. So um, Jim, any final words of wisdom before we wrap it up for this week? First, maybe jokingly, I, I hope we didn't interrupt you, Kay, as you were speaking. But Jeff, if we did, hopefully we can edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you know, my, my normal thing, which is for all of our listeners, we want to connect. We want to network. You can find Jeff and I on, on LinkedIn. It sounds like you can connect with Kay on LinkedIn as well. And then Kay, you're in the DC, you're, you're a Beltway person. Um, maybe if Jeff and I get out to DC, we can all go to a Washington Nationals game, uh, the World Series champions in 2019, right? Yes. <laughs> Kay is, is overly excited. I, I, I can tell from, from that, that, that prospect. <laughs> yeah, that would be fantastic. I, you know, you have to imagine at some point, um, people will be traveling again. So um, I'm looking forward to fist bumps and hallways and, you know, putting, putting those fist, fist bumps to virtual faces that I've been seeing over the last year. And, and hopefully, Kay, you know, the next, next time we're able to, to get in, in touch in the same spot, you know, let's, let's get a, a, a coffee, a beverage, you know, whatever it may be, 
wherever we happen to be and uh, look forward to that. So I think with that, we'll go ahead and close it out for this week. I um, want to thank Kay for, for being part of the show today and sharing her insights. Uh, Jim, thank you as always. Uh, you can find the show at identityatthecenter.com for those who are listening and want to check out some of our other uh, shows that we've done. And we're also on Twitter as well at IDAC podcast. And uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and leave it for the week. And we'll talk to you in the next one. Thanks for listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe and visit us on the web at identityatthecenter.com.